he was able to complete this book uh, posthumously for him. And I find it to be a real gift. Um, I've always loved watching Professor Reinhardt's uh, lectures. Um, he was the person that you didn't want to follow on a stage because he was so funny and uh, so good. And I will post uh, the link to a lecture he gave in 2009 before the Affordable Care Act was passed. And it is sadly almost entirely applicable still. Uh, but it's worth a watch, and uh, yeah, again, I know you're pressed for time now, but I'll post the link there when you get some time. It's worth watching because most of it is still uh, right on target. Um, two themes run through Professor Reinhardt's work throughout his career, uh, one being uh, the ethics of healthcare, and the other being the economics of healthcare. And uh, this book in particular covers the economic aspects in the first half and the ethical aspects in the second half. Uh, today I'm just going to go through the first half. Um, I may do something on the second half at some point just to gather those materials for myself as well. And if I do, I'll share, share them with you. Um, so I'll put some more references to the things that come up throughout this talk, uh, and you can explore these further at your leisure. So, just briefly, the book is called Priced Out, The Economic and Ethical Costs of American Healthcare Care by Uwe Reinhardt and uh, Professor uh, Sun Mei Chen. Let's get this to work. I can get this to work. Okay. You've all seen versions of this. You've all posted versions of this. And basically what it shows is that we spend way more uh, on health care than any other nation. No surprise there. So the question is why? Why do we spend so much more? Um, in this book, he tries to lay out why that is, and we're going to go through the factors that he thinks are most important one by one. Here's the four things he tries to uh, address in this book. Uh, one is, are, are what factors drive U.S. healthcare? Is it our ability to pay? In other words, because our GDP is higher, does that explain why our costs are higher? Is it the demographics of the USA? Our population is older and sicker. Um, is it just the high prices in the USA? Or is it the administrative burden that we talk about quite a bit in our message boards and uh, in our papers? Um, there's all, the other one is also, uh, you know, our population is more obese or what, whatever it is. There's always reasons. Uh, and I do address that one later as Professor Reinhardt does. But let's go through these one by one. So. Is it because our GDP is so much higher than other nations? Well, as it turns out, our GDP is higher than a lot of nations, but it's not higher than all of them. And if you draw a line, as you see here, um, about 2,228 is not explained uh, by our higher GDP. GDP. As you see, Switzerland over there has a higher GDP and significantly lower costs. So that's not it. Is it because of our demographics? Is it because we're just older? As you probably guessed, no, we're not older. Uh, there we are in the United States. Uh, the percentage of our population that's over 65 is uh, somewhere between 14 and 15 percent. You see the UK, Switzerland, Germany, Japan all have older populations and significantly lower costs. So, no, that's not it. Uh, is it the high prices in U.S. healthcare? Now, you've already Many of you have already referenced the famous It's the Price of Stupid article in your papers and message boards. In this book, he tries to lay out his case and refute critics' criticisms at, at the same time, so we're going to go through a little bit of this. So this is, uh, there's lots of graphics like this in the book. I just tried to pick a few uh, uh, representative ones. And so here's one. This is the price of Zorelto. Uh, which is a blood thinner, a newer blood thinner, so it's still expensive. And as you can see here, the price in the United States on average is around 290 bucks. Um, in the UK, it's 126 bucks. I think that's per month. Yeah, 30 day supply. Um, so 290, 126, 102, 101, etc. So we pay way more. And there's, there is actually a website, if I can find the link, I'll send it to you, that does a comparison of the major drugs in the U.S. and the OECD nations, and it's very depressing to, to look at, and just exactly as you'd expect. We just pay way more for everything, except 
especially the new biological drugs that are outrageous. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, at some point. Uh, but yeah, our prices are just way higher. So this is for an appendectomy. Um, <laughs> as you can see here, the uh, average price for an appendectomy in the U.S. is 15000 something. And the 95th percentile high is 33000 and even at our low end, the 25th percentile, we're still at 9,000. Uh, in the UK, it's 8,000. Switzerland, 6,000, et cetera. How about a normal delivery of a baby? How much could that be? Well, 10,800 in the US, 7,700 in Switzerland, 5,000 in Australia, and so on. Uh, this is knee replacement. So knee replacements here, these are not quite the outliers as they, uh, some of the other things are, but if you look at that 95th percentile for the U.S., 55,000 for knee replacement, 18,000 in the low end, uh, Switzerland 20,000, the U.K. 18,000, and so on. So, yeah, it is the prices, isn't it? At least that's a big part of it. Um, we'll talk about that later. So uh, finally, uh, the administrative burden that we talk about uh, quite a lot on our message boards and in our, in our uh, uh, papers. So is it the huge administrative burden? What is the administrative burden and how, how, how does it affect uh, uh, our healthcare costs? This is a famous slide from the group Physicians for a National Health Plan, which has been advocating for uh, single-payer health care, care, Medicare for all, some version of that for a long, long time. And this is one of their favorite slides and uh, makes the point quite nicely that this is the number of physicians, the dark line at the bottom that is growing, but not much. And then on the big rising graph is the number of administrators involved in health care administration. It says quite a lot in one quick slide, doesn't it? Okay, um, this is another interesting slide. This is from the McKinsey Global Institute, and they were basically looking at inputs and outputs on healthcare. And the things to uh, note in this is that as inputs for Americans, uh, again, per capita here, we actually use about $390 less in services and goods and healthcare. But the prices we pay, as you see there, are over $700 higher. Our administrative uh, overhead is almost $360 per capita more. Uh, there's a miscellaneous other expenses they have that's another $250 and so on. So even though we use less health, less health care, we actually pay quite a bit more for it, uh, which is a little disconcerting. Some of you in your delivery system profiles noted that there is variation in price between providers and insurers. Well, that, that's sort of the tip of the iceberg. This slide shows the variation in per member, per month, drug spending in 2011 and then 2016. And I'll let you take a second to look at that, but you can see there's tremendous variation in how much uh, different health plans spend on drugs. You see Aetna there at the top, Empire Blue Cross in New York there, uh, what else is in there? Independent health benefits and so on. And you can see, one, that they spend quite a, a different amount per member per month. And also everybody's prices or costs per member per month have gone way up since 2011. And this is just 2016. I expect that's much worse at this point. Um, and some of you can probably tell me about that. But yeah, it's uh, one, it's rising rapidly. Two, there's a huge variation. And that is just the tip of the iceberg of that, because we're going to talk some more about that. Where does that money go? Why, are the, why is there so much variation? What, what's going on? So this is a graphic um, showing the flow of a hypothetical $100 of expenditure on prescription drugs. This is all drugs, generic, uh, brand name, etc. And it's just to give you an idea of, of where the money goes. Uh, Dr. Reinhardt calls this the haircut. And uh, the haircut taken by, as you can see along the bottom, uh, the manufacturer's haircut, the wholesalers keep, he calls it, or haircut, the uh, pharm pharmacies keep, the uh, pharmacy benefit managers keep, the insurers keep, you know, basically these are all money taken off the top uh, of the system. So on the far right, you see about uh, $41 accrues to the manufacturer, about a third of which is profit. 
And at the far left, about $19 accrues to the insurers, of which they claim $3 is profit. And we can talk about what that means later um, in class, not in this lecture. Uh, the pharmaceutical benefits managers keep about 5 bucks, and they claim $2 of that as net profit. And wholesalers keep a couple bucks, 30 cents net profit. Uh, and the total net profit on a $100 expenditure is about 23 bucks. Um, the question of all the services and all the things that aren't profit, right? Things that aren't profit, but are they necessary? That's another topic, and we should talk about that at some point, too. <clears throat> Here they split it out into, on the top, uh, are brand name drugs, so the ones you see on TV all the time. And on the bottom are the generic drugs. And the point they want to make here, because it is an important point, for branded drugs, the manufacturer gets the lion's share of the money. So having that blockbuster new rheumatoid arthritis drug or what have you, <coughs> that's where the pharmaceutical manufacturers do so very, very well. Generic drugs, they do okay, but look how well everybody else does. All of the uh, middlemen make far more money on generic drugs than on the branded drugs. So here, a little uh, uh, they're getting. Okay. So, and just to make it clear, while manufacturers make about three times the gross profits on branded versus generic drugs, on generic expenditures, uh, the PBMs make four times as much, uh, and wholesalers make 11 times as much, and pharmacies 12 times as much on generic drugs. So, Lots of money going around. So we're going to move from drug price variability and costs to profit uh, to um, facilities. So this figure shows the charges are in gray. Okay, right. charges are in gray. Negotiated prices by the health plans are here in pink, right? And the uh, uh, Medicare prices are in blue. So. I'll leave you to look at that and draw your own conclusions. Uh, I will make these slides available so you can look at them more carefully, but I do urge you to get the book. Uh, but anyway, the point here is that there's tremendous variation between what Medicare charges, what the uh, uh, health plans negotiate, and what the actual charges that the hospital wants are. And keep in mind, these are averages. So it gets more interesting with the next slide. So. There is a huge price variability across health plans and facilities, and uh, it, it's just astounding. And this is uh, just a graph showing the different health plan facility combinations for hip replacement. On the far left, you see the outliers on the far left get about, what is that, 12 to 20,000, 15, 20,000 for a hip replacement, so those are, the, those are the inexpensive outliers. The outliers over here on the right get 40,000 or more for a hip replacement, right? For the same thing. This work, a lot of it is done by uh, what's called the Healthcare Pricing Project. Uh, I know one of the leads is uh, a guy down the road here at Carnegie Mellon University. I'll put a link so you can look at their work, but basically their work is focused on uh, what does uh, cause healthcare price variability. One of the key insights they've had, and I don't think it's any surprise, is that the fewer big players there are in any market, the higher the prices, right? So in our market here in Pittsburgh, we have two big players, the prices are high. Uh, other markets with multiple players, prices are lower. No surprise. Okay. Just to amplify this point again, uh, this is California data, and this is one insurer to various hospitals, A, B, C, and D. And look at the tremendous price variation. Whoop, sorry. Hospital A gets 1,800 for an appendectomy. Hospital E gets 13,700. For a cabbage, hospital A gets 33K and almost 100,000 in hospital E. Astounding variation. Same insurer, just different facilities. Uve likes to say that every health or every dollar of health spending is equal to someone's health care income. I phrase it, I think, a little more uh, uh, pithy. One man's waste is another man's remedy. Everything that we think is wasted in health care is somebody else making a living. 
So every dollar that we think is wasted in pharmaceutical industry, in health insurance industry, in pharmacy benefits managers, on and on and on. Every dollar that we think is wasted is somebody's paying somebody's mortgage. So it is a rough hill to climb to get change and to reduce waste. Um, this, you've actually talked about this a lot, how many jobs are in healthcare, and this just shows between 1990 and 2008, uh, 10 million jobs in healthcare in 1990, now 16 million, and you've all shared projections with me about how high that's going to be. It's just good to see it in context, right? Government versus healthcare versus re retail, and see what a huge chunk of the economy healthcare is. So not too many more slides. Uh, I'm just going to talk about who actually pays for healthcare, because I think although it's been said very obliquely uh, in the text and in a lot of your references, and like this is a perfect example of slide, uh, perfect example of the types of slides we see. And it says 34% of expenditures uh, of spending is from private health insurance, 21 by Medicare, 18 by Medicaid. 12% uh, by other public health programs, et cetera, et cetera. And you guys seem to have a handle on this. Um, but it makes it seem otherly. And the next slide, I think, is going to bring home the point. Who pays for health care? Well, we pay for health care, right? Ultimately, private health households, private individuals pay for all of this, right? We pay for it in our Medicare taxes and in our regular taxes that go for government programs. We pay for it in insurance premiums if we're paying them on our own. We primarily pay for them, however, in wages and cuts to our wages. And you can research if you, this if you like, and, and what you'll discover is that the stagnation in wages in the U.S. is largely due to the, uh, inflation in healthcare costs. And if healthcare costs weren't inflating so rapidly, wages would be increasing much more rapidly than they do. So. When we talk about private health insurance and employers' contribution, the employers are just contributing our wages. They're not you know, generously uh, giving us a benefit just for fun. They're doing it because it's part of the, part of the wage package. And uh, we can have another discussion about that. But I just wanted to make the point clearly that all this comes out of, of us. And so if you've heard debates on universal health care, you know, well, our taxes are going up, but your, your wages will go up also and you'll have less to you. That's what you get the idea. So next slide. This is the Milliman Medical Index, and it basically uh, tries to see how much the typical family of four pays for health care. And what they're showing here is from 2001 to 2016, the massive increase. 8400 for a family of four, now 25000 well then, 25800 uh, 2016, right? Um, so what this reflects is the employer's contribution, which we just talked about, plus the employee's contribution to the premium, because wherever you work, some of you pay, you cost share of the cost of the insurance premiums, and then the out-of-pocket spending, and a lot of you have pointed out how high our out-of-pocket spending is, and high deductible health plans, et cetera, et cetera. But the reason I like this slide is because remember the median household income, the median household income is only around $60,000. So, you know, when you're talking about low wage workers, it is going to be very unusual for a company to say, oh yeah, uh, of the $60,000 that I want to pay this pay person or 40 or 30 or so, I don't think I'm going to want to spend this on healthcare. We'll let them get it somewhere else. And of course, that's a problem. Um, there's the slide showing the median income. So he does, uh, Dr. Reinhardt, Professor Reinhardt, does briefly talk about household wealth and household income. And as you can see there, obviously, the distribution of household income is uh, skewed far, far, far to the top 1 and 5 and 10 percent. What I do want to urge you to do is watch this. Um, I'll put the reference in there. This is a YouTube talk by Dan Ariely. It's called How People Do We Want to Be. Um, professor Ariely is a professor at Duke University in the Fuqua School of Business. 
Uh, he's a behavioral economist. Uh, he's the author of a great book called Predictably Irrational, which I urge you all to pick up and read or listen to. That's how I do this. Uh, and several other books. Uh, he's really good, uh, really compelling character and a uh, good, good speaker. So in this talk, he explores the distribution of wealth in great detail with particular emphasis on what we think the distributions of wealth are, what the distributions of wealth actually are, and then what we think they should be. And the contrast there is just astounding, and it's, I, I really urge you to watch the video to get more out of it. And as a big bonus to me, he takes a side trip into John Rawls. John Rawls is a, a, a philosopher um, who has a th uh, wrote his most famous book, A Theory of Social Justice, that basically said, how do we want to construct society? And just to make a long story very short is he makes the point that a just society is a society where we would be happy to enter it not knowing our position, right? So not knowing whether we were going to be in the bottom 10% or 20% of earners or whether we were going to be in the top we would be okay with the fairness of entering the system at that, uh, anywhere in, in the system. So it's worth a watch, worth learning a little bit more about Rawls, uh, and I hope you do learn a little bit more about Rawls because he's very worthwhile. So I'm going to post the link, but I highly urge you to uh, check it out. And we obviously spent the first week talking about this, what is value in healthcare. And Professor Reinhardt goes through some of the same things that we touched on, that you touched on in your uh, in the message boards. So I'm not going to show many slides on this one, just the one that you have pointed out. And there's a bunch of different ways of looking at this, but basically the life expectancy of OECD women here, life expectancy of U.S. women here, OECD men here, U.S. men here. No surprise. I think you all know that. I did want to show in the obese, throw in the obesity slide uh, because that is often thrown up as well. We're uh, more obese and that's why we're sicker, blah, blah, blah. Uh, anyway, here's the data. And yes, we have far outstripped everybody else in our obesity except Mexico. Uh, but we're, you know, we're not that far ahead of England and Canada or France. The bottom here is 40%, that's 60. So yes, we are heavier and more obese. But not outrageously so, so and really not enough to explain the difference in, in our healthcare systems. Uh, second to last slide, this is just a summary of all the estimated excess costs in healthcare. And again, I'll share the slides with you so you can look at them you know, yourself. This is from an Institute of Medicine report. And basically the things we talked about, unnecessary services, inefficient delivery of services, uh, excessive administrative costs, uh, prices that are too high, uh, uh, missed preventive care opportunities, and fraud. And again, we'll probably get to more of these as the term goes on, but I just wanted to share it with you, and I'll put the link in the uh, uh, course. This is uh, one of Professor Reinhardt's uh, last articles, and I just wanted to share it because I think it's pertinent because we talk a lot about uh, the debate for universal health care and Medicare for all. And this article is just uh, uh, noting that although Medicare Advantage, as you know, is actually a pretty good deal if you're healthy and uh, don't have many medical needs, uh, and yet most people still cling to traditional Medicare. And why is that? And Professor Reinhardt offers, and I agree, the reasons are trust and choice. In spite of the bureaucracy and the rigidity of Medicare and CMS, you know it's going to be fair, right? And you know it's not going to try to uh, reduce your spending because it's trying to make a bigger profit. So there is some trust there. Again, in spite of the bureaucracy, you know it's going to be fair and treat you just as it treats everybody else. And then the other thing is choice. One of the maddening things I, I've heard over the decades about uh, switching to uh, uh, more universal healthcare models is the idea that uh, people want choice. And I don't know anybody who cares which flavor healthcare plan they get. What they want choice in is doctors and hospitals. And traditional Medicare gives you that. Pretty much everybody 
participates. And I can go to EPMC, which I can see from my window here, or uh, our Allegheny Health Network, or any of the private hospitals, private uh, nonprofit hospitals in the area. Everybody takes Medicare. Every doctor takes Medicare. So he argues that trust and choice are why people stay with Medicare, and, and I tend to agree with him. I'll post that link as well. And I think that's all I wanted to get to today. So hope you pick up this book at some point. I think you will uh, really enjoy it. Uh, have a great week. Thank you very much.